morning and it's been a while but welcome to another video um from me mr simon williams um but we're talking myself as mr simon williams that sounds a bit odd but um sorry about the break from youtube videos i'm going to try to get back into them now i've been away playing the british championships for the last two weeks and i was kind of concentrating on the chess there for a change and what i'm going to do today I'm going to have a quick look at one of my games against the top seed, David Howe, a game I lost. But I'm going to try to go over some typical mistakes I made during this game and have a little bit chat about the, the championships. So it was great fun. The championships was held at Warwick University, one of the best universities in England. Um, very big university, everything there, lots of nice student bars, but the chess was quite serious this time. Um, now... David Howe, my opponent here, was uh, the top seed. He's now about 27-20 rating. And after 11 rounds, well, I lost to him in a very interesting game, but I finished fifth equal. So let's just bring up the results. And if you bear with me, I can show you the final standing. So there we go. And you can see I was a point off the lead in the end. Um, Jonathan Hawkins, who actually lost to in the penultimate round managed to win outright very talented player jonathan hawkins easily over 2600 rating and a well-deserved winner of the championships this year played the best chess i'd say also danny gormali played equally you know very good as well but hawkins kept his nerve at the end and this guy could be a great player if he just plays a bit more then we see in second place david howe Nicholas Pert, who is pre previous under 18 world champion, and a very talented, like I said, Danny Gormani, who's leading the tournament for most of the most of the way. And I was in that group there on fifth equal with Mark Hebburn, Richard Pert, Nick Pert's twin brother. They played each other in the last round, believe it or not. Myself, Chris Ward, and Aaron Summerscale. So, very interesting tournament. Let's just go back now. I'll just show you a quick picture if I can get a quick picture of David Howe. So let's just see if we can get this up. Not a very good picture there. So but you can see half of his face there. Well, maybe half's better than none. But we will now go back to my game against him. And this was played, I believe, in round four. And I thought this was quite a critical game. I mean, I managed to defeat David a year before, but my score against him is generally pretty bad. And he is clearly a brilliant player. He's now over the 2700 mark he's just finished university so he's even got a degree as well and who knows how strong david could become he in my opinion could be one of the best british players ever if he is very determined very good position on standing his whole game is a rounded game so let's move on to the chess so i started with d4 and david now played a very solid setup and i've got a reputation as being a very aggressive hacky player and that might be the reason my opponent now plays bishop to b4 check and this is called the bogo indian and this line has a very solid reputation okay white should be slightly better but black keeps things in a very solid formation doesn't give much away and often just swaps some pieces off he can get a slightly cramped position but it's very hard to break his his structure down now you can block this check in three ways. Knight to c3 leads back into Nimzo Indian. Then there's bishop d2, which is a very perfectly fine move. And I normally prefer to move knight bd2 because now if my opponent ever takes on d2, after a move like a3, I gain the bishop pair. And the bishop pair is, is meant to be, it's meant to figure that it gives the person with the bishop pair a slight advantage. So my opponent now played b6. And this is a very standard move. He has to do something with bishop on c8. And by trying to play it to b7, he gains control of the most important square on the board, the e4 square. Watch out for the square later on. Now, I continue with g3. We both fianchettoed. And we both castled. Now, in my opinion, it's much better to have a fianchetto bishop in front of your king rather than fianchetto bishop on the queen side this is something that this very strong player giri once mentioned so if you can get a fianchetto bishop in front of your king it is going to be stronger than its counterpart because simply that bishop is defended so if i ever move my knight i'm not going to lose a bishop um it's defended and it gives me lots of tactical tricks later on now my opponent played the move a5 
And this is quite a crafty and I think decent move. It aims to gain space on the queen side and it's got a little positional idea behind it. One of my main options in this position is often to play the move A3, um, trying to kick that bishop away. But now my opponent has the option of taking on D2. And after something like bishop takes D2, he can play a very standard and common idea against this structure that I've highlighted on the queen side here, a3, b2, c4. He can play the move a4, and this clamps down on the b3 square where he has an outpost. Maybe later on the knight on b8 can try to find its way into b3, this outpost, via the route I just highlighted. And it makes it hard for my b pawn to move because he will take on, pass on, creating some pawn weaknesses. Maybe the pawn on a3 will be my main weakness in that, in that structure. So after this move, I didn't play a3 for that reason. I played a very interesting idea. Now I played move knight to b1. And I recommend you go to chess.com and have a look at the last article I did for them if you search their articles, because it was on weird knight maneuvers. But if you think about it logically, my knight on d2 was not a very good piece. It was blocking my bishop in. A much better square in these structures is the square c3, where I attack d5 in some positions and it's much more active. My bishop can come out. And I also have a little threat here. If my opponent continues without thinking with a move like d6, then I can actually play very strongly with c5. And all of a sudden this bishop on b4 is threatened to be trapped with the move a3, which is pretty horrible already for in this position. So David saw this little threat, obviously, being the great player he is, and instead of d6, he moved his bishop to e7. Now, again, this is a very subtle position, and I just want to talk about this a little bit, because when you're playing chess, so important to not just consider your own moves, but you must always keep an eye on your opponent's like, options as well. Now the natural move, knight to c3, kind of runs into what my opponent wants to play. There's nothing wrong with this move, but my opponent wants to swap off these knights, and now he can play knight to e4. And if there ever is an exchange on e4, he can now move his f-pawn. And generally there's a rule that you should stick by in chess, and that is if you have more space, you should avoid swapping pieces off. And I have more space here because of my pawn structure. So I want to avoid giving him the easy exchange of pieces. So with my next crafty move, not knight to c3, but rook to e1, I'm trying to somehow play e4. And the point is now, if my opponent plays knight to e4, he can run into the threat knight to d2. And this nasty pin, remember I said about this bishop in front of my king, puts him in some trouble. I mean, how does he deal with his knight on e4? He's probably going to have to play a very uncomfortable move here. And again, if I'd have played knight to c3, my opponent played knight to e4 now. Well, knight to d2 is not possible here because my opponent has the option of going knight takes c3, sopping some pieces off, which is clearly okay for him. So rook to e1, I think, is a very crafty move here. My opponent now decided to go queen to c8 not knight to e4, queen to c8. And the idea of this is simply to defend the bishop on b7. And here, I, I probably did one of my standard mistakes in chess. I'm actually quite a good positional player, but I'm a little bit of a lunatic, and I lose the plot often. And I really should be confident playing positional lines against most people in the world. And here, a sensible move, like even knight to c3 now would be okay. But I went for a gambit line, true to my spirit, and I saw a very interesting possibility, which went d5. So this is where it really heats up, and I'm trying to sacrifice in the centre to take advantage of my opponent's rather strange piece configuration. And the point is, after pawn takes d5, pawn takes d5, now bishop takes d5, I had the idea of sacking another pawn with e4. Very interesting variation. And if my opponent retreats his bishop, I'm one pawn down. But look at Eddie the e-pawn. Here he comes. Eddie the e-pawn is going to be my front runner. He's a crazy little pawn. He's going to slash up my opponent's position. 
That's a bit, bit. You have to, you have to be like a bit like brutal when playing chess. And I want to go here, and I want to try to get a, an attack eventually against my opponent's king. And I think I've got great compensation here. My rook on e1 now looks very good. So my opponent played bishop takes e4, and again, this is where I had another rush of blood to the head. Um, I really wanted to try to win this game. I thought if I'm going to win the British Championships, then beating David is going to be the only way I'm going to do this, take matters into my own hand. And I now saw the following line, knight to c3, where my opponent has a lot of problems here because of the e-file threats. He has to go d5. And now my best line is knight takes e4. He has to take with a pawn because if he takes with a knight, I can go queen takes d5, and this is horrible. And after pawn takes d5, e4, sorry, I can play knight to g5. And even though I'm two pawns down, my position doesn't really hold any risk. My bishop on g2 is, is a beautiful piece. And I'm going to win one pawn back on e4 and have two bishops in an open position. Now, I should have gone for this, where I think I'm slightly better with, with great chances to, to push, push in the game. Um, at the time, I thought this might be a little bit too drawish. I wasn't too convinced by it. And I saw another possibility that I thought would have been... It was more crazy. It's more of a cowboy move, the line I played. And, okay, you may know I've been called the psycho cowboy before. And that move was rook takes e4. With the idea, after knight takes e4, of playing queen to d5. And here, well... He doesn't really want to let his rook drop, so my opponent flicks in, knight takes g3. And now we get to a very interesting position after h takes g3, c6, queen to h5. Time to take stock. And when I when I decided to go into this line, I evaluated that I, well, I thought I'd have great winning and attacking chances here. Even though my opponent has three pawns for my two minor pieces and rook... So he is material up. Two minor pieces is a very good attacking unit. And my opponent has badly developed it. So I thought I must have great attacking chances. But I think I really need one more tempo here. If my knight was on c3, I'd be doing excellently. Probably nearly winning. But here, my opponent managed to defend very well. And the position is still very interesting. I went d5, bishop h3, attacking the queen. Queen b7. And now I had a long think. And... Quite generally in a game, after having a long think, you go against your natural gut instincts and you play a bad move. I mean, I, there's two moves that I was really first considering. First of all, what's wrong with a simple knight to c3? When I want to maybe move my bishop to g5 next and even play king g2 and rook to h1 with some kind of attack on the h-file. And this will give me, I think, very decent compensation. My opponent can probably defend over something like knight to d7, trying to come to f6. Of course, he can defend, but I still have this pressure against him. And the other move that made a lot of sense here was the move something like to g5, knight to g5, for example. And after bishop takes g5, bishop takes g5. And again, here I've got three pieces around his king. I've got my knight maybe trying to enter into the attack with great chances. So I now miscalculated, and I say this so many times, when you're trying to get better as a chess player, one of the key things is calculation, and you've really got to be so good. I'm a little bit rusty at the moment. I mean, I've only been playing sort of blitz chess recently, and my calculation was not that good, and even it got better at the end of the tournament, but at the start it was not good. So a key thing, improve your calculation, and now I played the move with a bad, bad move, bishop to f5. Thinking I had a good attack, but I miscalculated here. Looks very dangerous. My opponent plays g6. I go queen to h6. And now my opponent cannot take on f5 because I win immediately with knight to g5. And if he takes this, I have checkmate. Can you see how? Pause the video if you need to. Well, queen takes g5. And now queen f6 and simply bishop to h6 and queen g7 checkmate is coming no matter what. But my opponent had defended. I, he defended in a way I did not think was possible. And that was with rook to e8. And I 
kind of overlooked this idea, the following variation that he pay, played. Very good. And now the problem is if my bishop can go if my opponent's bishop can go bishop f8 to g7, he's covered a lot of his squares and he's going to be defending well. And I didn't want to allow this. So I went forwards, of course. It's not like me to go backwards. But I missed the following line. Bishop takes bishop. Bishop takes bishop. And now the excellent move. Looks like he could be in trouble here. The excellent move, though. Pawn to f6. And this queen on b7 comes over to defend. And it was only around here it dawned on me that I'm probably losing to my dismay. My opponent was very short of time here as well. So had I kept the tension a bit better and not played like such a complete nutter, I would have played a lot better. So there's stuff to learn from games like this. Don't play overly crazily unless you can see a good solution. The simple options are better than the crazy options. Don't If you have a, a simple good option that's better for you without any risks, play that. No point going crazy if you can't see the final lines. And the problem here is, well, if I go bishop takes f6, which I was originally trying, you know, this is my original intention when calculating this, because if he takes on f5, I get a, well, winning attack probably with queen g5 check, a very strong attack. And, but my opponent does not take that one. He just goes queen to f7. And now I cannot defend both my bishops and he defends everything. And it's really game over around here. So I was very disappointed here. I tried to, I thought, well, if you're going to go down, you might as well go down in a blaze of glory rather than in a fade away of obscurity. Go go away in a blaze of glory. Give up all your pieces and, uh, you know, who knows. So I took on g6, but my opponent now played rookie one check. Again, it shows you if my knight was on c3, my position may have been okay there. King g2 now took on g5. Knight to d2. Here we go. Just giving all my pieces up like a proper coffee house game from the Romantic era. He took here now bishop f5 with some vague hopes of going bishop e6 check and queen to f8 checkmate. But of course, I'm half my army down. So my opponent simply defended knight to a6. I try to bring in all my pieces towards his king, but you can it's clear to see as soon as he gets his queen here, he's very well defended. And... I resigned in this position. So, okay, so that was maybe one of the most important games earlier on in the tournament. My other important game was against the eventual winner in the penultimate round, Jonathan Hawkins, which I played pretty horribly. He played very well, and I lost uh, that game. But this game, I still had a lot of chances here. I mean, the opening, I think I played well, but I just lost the plot a little bit. So, lesson to be learnt there. Don't go too crazy. Keep it simple. And I'll just maybe do a couple other games of the British to keep the interest up um, of, you know, of, of what happened at this year's British Championships 2015 and show you my perspective on things and how I'm improving in a way I was thinking during my games. I'm just going to try to keep the videos reasonably short if I can. Um, tell me if you like that. And of course, I'll get back to playing some Blitz again soon, some crazy Blitz. And I'll try to get another one done another video done after this video so anyway um it's good to be back hello everyone please leave your comments please like the video and subscribe all very welcome and that helps me make more videos and yeah i'm looking forward to hearing your comments good to be back cheers cheers for now anyway bye